today's discussion, we are talking about simplifying digital transformation uh, with an API-aware mindset. Um, so I'm conscious that this talk has to be delivered between myself and Mark, so I have 15 minutes. Um, I'm not going to go into technical, but I'm just going to explain something uh, similar, something small uh, that we adopt to deliver our customers in order to expedite digital transformation. Um, so let's move into the next slide. Uh, we are in the era of digital transformation, and everybody's talking about digital transformation. This particular Google trend was extracted last week from 2013, uh, 2013 to 2018. There's a huge trend, and everybody in all parts of the world is adapting digital transformation. It's, it's a buzzword, but then again, uh, you have to be conscious that what it really means. There is a lot of misconceptions. I mean, I don't think that everybody had really understood what digital transformation is. There are some people who had really done well, understood the real concept. Some of them are really doing it, but some of them had no clue. But the fact that it is already happening, you know, like people who used to listen to radio cassettes, vinyl records, now streaming music from SoundCloud. And, I mean, if you want to go on a date on a Saturday night, you don't physically meet anybody. You go to Tinder and swipe left and right. So things are being digital every day, reinventing. Um, so the question is whether it's really understood well. Um, you're going through this digital journey, and it's, it's not about moving things into social media or digital channels. I mean, you can just do it and then call that you're digitally transformed. No, not really. Or, or if you, like, consider that as a project and then run it in one year and then call we are digitally transformed. No, or the worst case, you get a bunch of in interns to do it and say, this is your project, run digital transformation. No, it doesn't really work. Um, so as a digital transformation, we, we work with a lot of clients, including Charles Perkins and so many other clients. Um, so when we started uh, the projects, I mean, basic thing that we do is that sit them down and then really understand whether they um, understand the concept of digital transformation. I mean, there's a huge scope if you look at the end goal, if you really do digital transformation, it actually falls into some of the categories that you're in. They might have different objectives when it comes to digital transformation, but then again, we can actually group them into similar objectives. So if you rightfully digitally transform, it brings you the agility of developing products um, and implementing solutions. And it actually enhances your services and giving you uh, the length that you never had before. And it makes you really competitive in the market because you can deliver products to the business change rapidly. And this gives you the competitive advantage. And for you to do that, of course, you need to make sure your employees are really skilled. I mean, there is a huge gap that we find in the market. So you need to gap that. And then what you find is reskilled employees. And then they are really technically savvy in order to make sure that you can go this journey together. And also, it, it comes with a lot of other aspects, and regulations, and you know, it enhances your uh, data privacy, the way you look at customers' data, and it actually puts you in a very good place. And also, it makes the customer's engagement really, really good, so that you can actually uh, predict a lot of the things, you know, because it gives you the ability to extract data and make sure that you can analyze all this and do the transformation and your course correction when you need it really well. And this gives you the enhanced sales capability, you know, and also the results or, or the data that you need to readjust your marketing strategies. And in, with that, like, you, you have a whole lot of other things coming together. So it's, in, it's undoubtedly a lot of things that you get with the digital transformation when it's implemented correctly. But, but the point is that you can't do all this at once. I mean, if you go and tell a client that this is what you get, the benefits, 
I mean, if, if they have the understanding that you can implement all of this at once, I mean, we are talking about a white elephant. But the fact that there is an approach that we follow, a very lean way of making somebody's digitally transformed. So simplifying this, I mean, this whole topic is about simplifying digital transformation, having an API mindset. Um, we believe simplification is all about decomposition. So you try to decompose a problem as much as possible so that you can actually apply solutions to it in a rapid way, in an agile way, so that you can actually see the solution goes in the correct direction. So um, we use, in, with our clients, a, a concept called digital transformation canvas. Um, so we, we kind of created our own way of understanding client's problem and then deliver the solutions accordingly. Um, so the objectives that I showed in the previous slide, those are the key objectives that you want to achieve as a transformed or digitally transformed company. And we use this methodology like objectives mapped to key results. So in the canvas, what we do is that uh, we get the key results uh, listed. So if you take one objective and you can actually understand what are the key results that you need to deliver this particular objective. And uh, this actually comes with clients' workshops. I mean, if you know about WSO2's QSPs, um, could nicely align with that because we can sit down with the client, show them this is where you want to go, and try to build um, short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals, and try to get the short-term loans, and then um, try to derive some key results how you actually deliver this particular set of objectives in the short-term goal, and then how to kind of build that, right? So these workshops actually help you to, to get customers' need, and then you try to map it back to the original key objectives that we discussed. And then uh, we have this um, decomposer model. So decomposer model is actually kind of built based on all our experience I mean, in the last few years, um, how we actually get a particular result, and we kind of decompose it into the uh, levels that we need to actually break it down so that we can address different uh, objectives, different problems in, with different solutions. Um, so when you actually build the decomposer model, we get a set of key results broken down to a decomposed way so that we have um, the, so the problems in a, in a nicely aligned way. Um, then what we do, go about creating a capability map. So the capability map is, in order to deliver those decomposed problems, what capabilities that you need? And this actually comes with different capabilities. It could be identity management, it could be um, API management, integration, and it could be um, any other thing, like even an application requirement. So when you build a capability matrix, it'll be really easy for you to understand um, what needs to be done and what needs to bridge in order to deliver the entire solution. So that's where the, the bridge model comes in. So the bridge model actually uh, comes with several pre-built uh, models, like how, what, what skills that you need to enhance um, as, as the employees. If you want to be self-sufficient, do you need to bring in vendors with specific skill sets? Uh, and you analyze your legacy assets, or the legacy systems, and then understand the interfaces between them. And also the external factors. I mean, more like the non-functional requirements and how they actually align to your organization. I mean, if you want to go somewhere uh, to, as a journey, and then what are the external non-functional requirements that you need to achieve? And also, what kind of an experience that you need to give to the client uh, and employees. So this is one of the key things. You know, Digital transformation is about bringing a good experience uh, to the client. At the same time, you're bringing a good experience to your employees as well. So it has to go hand in hand. It has to balance. Um, and also, like the, the total cost of ownership of the solution, um, th these things are really important. And how fast you can actually deliver these solutions in, based on the agility models that you have, and how you actually bring innovation. So these, the bridges that actually have different models that we work on, then, these are like templated ones. It like, works like you, you ask a few questions from the client, and then we have a checklist, and we put, put a structure together. And then that actually helps you 
to map the solution. I mean, this is the most important part of the canvas that we do. Um, once you have the capability map and the bridge solutions all together, we start to map our uh, solution components into it. So we have reference architectures and we have Catalyst. So the reference architectures are pretty much, I mean, a lot of WSO2 ones. We have a lot of WSO2 reference architectures that we use. Um, and then what we do is, from our level zero architectures that is being built in the bridge level, what we try to do is we try to map the reference architectures into that. And we tweak the architectures once in a while, of course, uh, in order to adapt to the situation. And also, we, we have Catalyst. The Catalyst actually expedites your solution so that you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. So you have the components built. I think Mark is going to explain more about it later on. Um, so all of these will generate a nice delivery plan. So now you have a, a proper delivery plan, um, and, and you know exactly what you need to build. And this would actually build you a nice roadmap for you to deliver the solution. So this will only deliver a specific set of objectives. So you could do the same thing to multiple uh, objectives broken down to key results. I mean, this is an exercise that we do continuously. I mean, like this, this can be an, uh, a progressively elaborative process. You know, like it's all about uh, getting a canvas. It's just the canvas is just a guide for you to to bring it together, and then you have a way of nicely delivering a solution and, and a predictable way. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much about it. I mean, you can go deep down it uh, with the examples later on, but time actually uh, is limiting me. Um, so if you want to know more about it, um, our booth is outside. You can have a chat with me or the guys there. You can explain it a little bit more. Um, right, so next up, I think Mark is ready to explain how Travis Perkins had ad adapted uh, you know, API awareness digital transformation. Mark. Hello, everyone. I'm the um, Enterprise Integration Architect for Travis Perkins, and I'm going to talk to you today about our journey through digital transformation. So just to give you a little bit of background about Travis Perkins. So Travis Perkins was formed in 1988 with the UK's largest dist distributor of building materials. We supply building materials to, uh, for, for over 200 years to the trade, and we are composed of around 20 or more brands within the group. So what does that mean? That means, obviously, within Travis Perkins, we also have Wix within the group as well. We have Tile Giant and Tool Station within our retail division. We also have in our merchandising division, obviously, Travis Perkins and Benchmarks. We also have in our contracts division, CCF, BSS, and Keyline. And we have a number of other brands within our plumbing and heating division. So within Travis Perkins, we're actually made up of a number of brands um, within the group. So how do we transform Tra Travis Perkins with an API mindset? So this is our challenge that we face today. So within Travis Perkins, we have around 400 or so business applications across the 20 plus brands that we have. The reason for that is as Travis, per Travis Perkins has grown organically over the years, we've obviously acquired those businesses. And by acquiring those businesses, we've also acquired their IT estate and brought it into our data center. By doing that, obviously, we've actually got very complex integrations. We've got a lot of historic integration patterns around EDI uh, and file transfer. Pretty much 90% of the data flowing through our data center is file transfer. We've also got applications sitting in clouds. We've got some applications in AWS and Google. And we've also got a lot of systems as software as a service. So we've got quite a complex um, estate within Travis Perkins. And what we've got in the middle there is our ERP system, which is around 40 years old. And it's based on the PIC programming language. And as we've grown over the years, it's obviously grown from an ERP system. And within that ERP system, we also have warehouse management and rebates management. It's actually grown into a, quite a monolithic application. So what's our approach? Our approach is to use integration as an enabler. And that's WSO2. We want to be able to provide a layer of abstraction to insulate us from future change. You want to be able to remove those point-to-point -point integrations. What that means for our current architecture, our transition, and our target architecture is that actually we need to have 
we need to meet different integration styles. So that's file transfer, that might be messaging, it might be services, um, and it might be ETL as well. So you need to be able to understand your integration capabilities and your tools. And where we started our journey was to build private APIs and be able to build those APIs so we can scale for future growth and transformation. And some of those products that we use here are API Manager, Message Broker, the Enterprise Service Bus, and the Data Services Server. So what's our blueprint? Our blueprint is obviously starting with the building blocks. So we've got our tools. We've got the tools that we need for the different integration styles that we're adopting. But we need to be able to uh, assemble integrations rather than build integrations. We need to be able to assemble fast uh, and change to the marketplace. So with those building blocks, what we need to do is cement the foundations. So that means we need to be able to define the patterns define the principles around those patterns. So when do you use a specific pattern? So when do you use pattern A, and when do you use pattern P, B? How do you use the patterns? And also with that, obviously, we need to make sure that we've got tight governance in place as well to ensure that we're using best practice, we're using the right tools for the job, and we're using the right patterns for the integration types that we're doing. And that then gets us on to the last picture where, where we are today, which is where we've managed to establish that structure. So we're still building that structure, we're still trying to add layers on top of it to be able to deliver value to our business. But we're still building. So the crucial link here is obviously our building blocks. We need to be able to assemble integrations fast. And that means reusable, pluggable components within our architecture. And that could be something like a class mediator. It could be a template. It could be a microservice. But we need to be able to build these, assemble these integrations fast. And like I said at the bottom, making Lego requires a lot of work, but using Lego is child's play. So you need to be able to assemble these things quickly. So just to give you sort of an example, a flavor of what a building block might look like, within our middleware estate, obviously, we've got something in the region of about 150 interfaces. What we don't want to do is be able to obviously build and log in 150 different ways. We want to be able to standardize our logging, standardize our format, standardize the attributes that our support teams need to be able to use and look at that data. So we do something called a logger building block. It's quite simple. You have an input, which is your interface, your parameters that are going in. The building block does some logic. And on the other side, on the output, you've got a standard output, which is in a JSON format with standard attributes. But what we do is, because obviously within Travis Perkins, we have some onshore and we have some offshore development teams, we want to make sure across all our development teams that we're all logging in a standard way. So when it comes to support those 150 integrations, we can do it in the right way. And we can do it quickly and resolve issues very quickly. So the glue, or the cement, I call it, what, is, what does that look like? So uh, building an API, probably quite simple, but the implementation of that behind the scenes and how it all works is the real crux of it and how it works. So at the top, we've got our clients. Okay? And our clients obviously interact with us through our boundary or our control plane, as obviously we, we spoke this morning. So we've got our web APIs. We've got our message APIs. And with that, we have within our uh, APIs, they inject those messages into our ESB via an adapter. So we have an adapter process where we can obviously trans we can transform one interface into another. So it becomes plug and play. So as we introduce new clients into our middleware, into our, into our business, we can actually add new adapters and reuse the estate that we've already got. So within our middleware, we have something called a canonical data model. We need to be able to standardize our data. We need to be able to understand our data. By having a canonical data model, we can actually simplify our integrations, and we can get a lot of reuse out of the data pipes that we build. So if we add in a brand new client, then obviously if they've got their own bespoke message format, we can introduce an adapter and reuse the canonical data format. We can reuse the building blocks we've already built within our within our middleware and build integrations fast and reduce risk, reduce change. And obviously, by, being, by doing that, we can actually be very quick and be agile to the business and make changes quickly and adapt quickly. So what does our current structure look like? So we've gone from our, our brown field into sort of like a mixture of brown and a bit of green. This is where we sort of are, we are today. So hopefully, it looks like a much more simplified landscape. Um, we've got a lot of our WSO2 products up in our cloud there. Obviously, um, what we're doing at the minute is obviously we are obviously introducing a new ERP system. So as part of the project of our digital transformation is to obviously um, uh, replace our ERP system. 
So we've got our boundaries, our gateways on the left-hand side, and that's a WC2 message broker, it's an API manager, and it's a file transfer gateway. So our customers interact with us through that boundary where we can enforce security, enforce policies, throttling, rate limiting, all those sort of things. Obviously, within, within the middleware, nothing talks to the ESP directly. Everything has to go through a gateway. But then we've got our legacy estate uh, in our data center. And again, that's all abstracted via API. So again, we have a lot of uh, legacy systems. Everything's file-based. We have a lot of EDI documents coming into the estate, for example. Again, it's all files. So what we do is we use some ETL jobs to basically take those messages take that data, transform it into messages, and push it to an API. So we're completely insulated and completely abstracted uh, for future change. And that way, in the future, if we want to be able to do B2B integration and integrate with our partners, we can reuse these pipes that we've built in the enterprise service bus. We can reuse the canonical data models. We can reuse all that good stuff and all the adapters and all the integration that we've got in there that integrates with our downstream systems. We can reuse that, and we can reuse that quite simply, because all we've got to do for a partner is actually just create a partner API with a bit more authentication and authorization around it, but inject it into those things that we've already built today. So we're getting reusability. So we can build fast. We can adapt fast to changing conditions in the market. Obviously we, obviously, we have a lot of software as a service. So again, because we've got our stuff in the cloud, it allows us to integrate nicely with our cloud systems and our software as a service. So how do we add value to what we've already established and what we've already built today? So that's where we talk about our partner APIs. We start with our private APIs. We get those right. And then obviously we then move into where we can add value with our partner APIs. So can we connect with our EDI partners? Can we reuse those data pipes that we've already built? Can we do it quickly? Can we enforce security in the right way? Can we grow the business and can we grow the business being able to be able to adapt and change quickly with transformation? So what did we learn from our current journey that we're in at the minute? So one thing to ensure is to make sure that you capacity plan your infrastructure. What, we don't, what you don't want to be doing is right at the end, once you start putting projects live, right at the end having to change your deployment architecture because you haven't properly capacity planned for the throughput and the size of messages going through your middleware. So make sure you continually manage that capacity and change and adapt where you need to. We've already touched on logging monitoring. We have over 150 interfaces and, and increasing within our middleware environment. We need to make sure we log and we monitor in a standard way. So we can use our log aggregation tools to aggregate all that key data, and we can resolve issues very quickly. The third point, being agile in your approach, fail fast. It's good to make mistakes. It's good to fail, because that's how we learn. That's how we improve. That's how we actually understand our tool sets. So within Travis Perkins, we have multiple tool sets that support different styles and mixes of integration. So being able, to, being able to make mistakes and fail, we can actually learn and understand the products. We can learn and understand and improve how we do things and how we move forward, how we adapt our, our patterns and our processes, and how we adapt our principles as we, as we move forward and as we be agile. Most important as well, consider support from the outset. Make sure you include your support teams when you're building your integrations. Make sure that they can actually support them when you put them live from the outset. You don't want to be making lots of changes right at the end just because you need to be able to support them when you go into production. Do it from the off. Design with scalability in mind. Make sure that you can scale. If we're going to transform our business and look at new business ventures and change the market conditions, we need to make sure that our middleware can scale and support that process as we move forward. Understand your tools and make sure you use the best tool for the job. Like I said before, we have multiple tools within Travis Perkins that do integration, different styles of integration, where it's file transfer, where it's messaging, where it's services, or ETL. Make sure you do use the right tools for the job. Make sure you have those principles and those design patterns established so you can make those right decisions around which tool you use. Think about reusability rather than, rather than of, and avoid duplication. So you want to write it once. You don't want to write it many times, like we've already spoke about the building block um, process. Make sure you can build your components and reuse them. And that's how you can build fast, where you can assemble fast, you can have quality code going through your data pipes. And lastly, and probably most important, is governance. Make sure you've got a governance around your whole process, your whole middleware architecture. Make sure that you have got the, the patterns defined and the principles. Make sure you're including other people within your teams that are responsible with the different areas in integration, like DevOps 
like support, like your engineers. Make sure you include them in your forums. Make sure everyone is buying into what you're trying to do. Make sure everyone's buying into the fact that we are using the right pattern here. We are following principles. If we're not going to follow principles, make sure you document it. And by having governance, we can make sure that we can make sure adopt and follow standards, improve our standards, and make sure that what we're building is something that's consistent and that's something that's driving the business forward and matches our target architecture where we're trying to go. Thank you.